Hello, hello, Ralph. Can you hear me? Hey, good morning, Val. Yeah, all good. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Fantastic. Excellent. Great. Yeah, thanks for making time today. Uh, this is a great occasion because uh, we've just published the Merapi book and you are the uh, editor-in-chief of the Merapi book and uh, I'm one of the co-editors. So I think it's a great opportunity to talk a little bit about this new book and uh, yeah, so thanks for making time. But before we go into that, Ralph, can you say a word to kind of the people out there about how long it took us to get the book together? Well, I guess we, we should almost keep this uh, for ourselves, but <laughs> <laughs> it started uh, probably about a decade ago, isn't it? When, uh, you know, I was, uh, ha I had chats with uh, with uh, Johanna Schwarz from Springer and then you were involved in those uh, in those times. And then it, it took a long time for us to to plan the book, to get the Indonesian colleagues on, on board and get the official permission and approval from the Indonesian side. Um, of course, and and then once we had that, um, we we signed a contract with Springer in 2017, and uh, from then on uh, we worked uh, on the book. Uh, you know, uh, managed the the authors and getting everything ready. Then COVID struck, which wasn't uh, helpful. Mirapi played up again uh, in 2018, um, so which led to to some delays. But uh, here we are, and here's the product finally. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. It was about a decade. I mean, the first discussions started, uh, yeah, uh, a decade ago, and then they got more serious during the 2014 um, IAFTA meeting in Jogja. And then, uh, yeah, we were talking to people and asking who wants to be involved and who, who, who we think should be involved, who can contribute. And it was a long process, but here it is. And now it's over 500 pages with 18 chapters. It's one of the the bigger, uh, a more monumental volume, as one of the Springer editors called it, uh, in the series. So um, I, I'm personally very, very happy with the outcome. And uh, let me quickly say there's, of course, Ralph yourself as the editor-in-chief. And then there's myself as your wingman. And then Thomas Walter from GFZ. And then Made from uh, the Merapi Volcano Observatory in uh, Jogja. And um, Antonio Zratomo Porvo, who is now at the Geological Agency in Bandung, and he is the former head of the Merapi Observatory. And uh, they have, of course, been great contributors here as well. So then uh, maybe we should have a little look at the book, if that's okay for you. Yes, absolutely. Good, then I'll um, change this and um, I will just um, get uh, the book up on screen in a second. So here we are. So I'll share screen again. So here's the book and this is now the electronic copy that uh, Springer supplied. So we can look at this and uh, we've seen the front here. And uh, maybe you want to say a word about uh, the, uh, the foreword and uh, the opening letter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, as you just said, you know, the book uh, is one of the, the bigger ones in, in the Active Volcanoes of the World book series from Springer. And um, I think what we have, what we try to achieve here is to to really have a, a good and balanced overview of the state of the art of uh, Merapi Volcano. Um, what is known, having a snapshot of the current state of the art and knowledge of Merapi Volcano. And that meant that we had to probably compromise a little bit on the time, I guess when you write and edit a book like this, you know, you have to either compromise on the content or on the time. And I think we found a, a good balance to get all the chapters into the book we wanted to without compromising on the quality. Um, and we sacrificed a little bit uh, on the time, but uh, it was also appreciated by the authors, you know, to, so that we could have those chapters in Absolutely. the book. Absolutely. <laughs> I think the end product uh, justifies sort of um, the way we, we handled that. I'm very pleased with uh, the outcome um, at the end. So I'm very grateful to um, John Pallister and then Jake Lobenstern from the USGS to, uh, for providing a, a foreword uh, for, for us, an opening letter. Um, both have been involved in in research at Merapi in the crisis management, for example, uh, in 2010, uh, during the last major eruption 
uh, of Volcano and it's uh, been quite pleased to see, uh, uh, have been quite pleased, you know, that they uh, agreed to, to write the, the foreword for us uh, and uh, basically provide yeah. an overview um, of the book and uh, describing sort of um, its value and um, the contributions inside the book. So, and then we have a foreword from uh, Andiani, and uh, this is uh, from the Indonesian uh, uh, authorities. And uh, here, uh, she is the head of the Center of Volcanology, and she is putting this into uh, an Indonesian context uh, in terms of the local kind of setup, the organizational structure of how volcanoes are monitored going through the original Dutch efforts during the colonial period and uh, how Indonesia took over after the uh, revolution in 1949 and uh, improved the records uh, steadily through the years until we are now dealing with a very modern, a very sophisticated observation system, not just for Merapi, but all over Indonesia at this point. And uh, she has summarized this very elegantly, in my view. And uh, this is a, a nice opening there for the book, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the book is for the international volcanological community, but it's uh, on a very important, iconic volcano in Indonesia. It's a it's a book, you know, for for and with the Indonesian colleagues, um, and uh, so very grateful for uh, having the support from everybody in Indonesia, from the Volcanological Survey, from our colleagues at the Merapi Volcano Observatory, who have been heavily involved in the book, and uh, also very grateful to Andiani, who provided that nice uh, forward from the Indonesian perspective, uh, as you just said. Wonderful. And then why don't we go a little bit? Uh, well, there's our acknowledgements. We kind of summarized them now. Um, uh, but uh, let's uh, maybe have a little look at the at the content list, if that's all right for you. Yeah, you can do that. Um... So uh, I'm going to introduce the first uh, paper, if that's OK, because you're the lead author. So <laughs> I'll, take the, I'll take the brunt here. Uh, um, so... Give me your take. Give me your take on this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very good paper, I think. As uh, John Pallister actually said in the introduction, it's uh, it's it was a lot of work as well, but um, it's uh, the journey uh, that uh, research took uh, in the in the region and particularly about Merapi. It's a uh, it's a summary of very early research going back to Indonesian efforts and um, uh, then through the colonial period and uh, then into the modern era and then also into what I would call the IT age, into the technology-driven monitoring efforts of the last decades. And uh, Ralph, you are the leader of that chapter and I'm your wingman here and Madi, the head of uh, the former head of the observatory in uh, Jogja. Um, he has been also a very strong contributor here and the three of us together have put this, uh, but mainly under your lead. And uh, I think it's uh, not just a well illustrated chapter, it's also kind of really comprehensive. So as John Pallister put it, to use his words, every student of Merabi should actually use that chapter because it is it does give this kind of background and how things came about, how our understanding developed. So this is uh, this is very important. Then chapter number two, and here I'll pass the word over to you if that's all right, Ralph. Yeah, so chapter two is one of the um, early chapters in the book, uh, setting the, the context uh, at Merapi and Frank Lavinia, who has worked at Merapi for a long, long time. Uh, his specialism is on, on Lahars and also on uh, sort of some of the social aspects, uh, the, the human uh, context at Merapi. And, and Frank and his co-workers, um, they provide sort of an overview of the physical environment, uh, the morphology of Merapi and the human context. We all know Merapi is a heavily uh, populated volcano. It's a very hazardous volcano. Uh, a lot of people are at risk from the almost constant volcanic activity uh, of Merapi. And Frank, in, Frank uh, in this particular chapter, uh, setting the scene and then focusing in particular on the 2010 eruption, which was a very powerful a VI4 eruption, which uh, killed 400 people. And uh, Frank uh, discusses sort of um, the livelihood at Merapi and how life continued after this devastating event um, and uh, looking forward in, in terms of um, how the population um, can live um, basically with Merapi and the danger it, it presents. 
Fantastic. The following chapter, number three, and uh, if that's okay for you, I'll take the next turn, is by Karen Holmberg. And uh, here we have a discussion of Merapi and its dis disaster culture, i.e. the way people cope in a cultural context with the volcano and how this is interwoven with daily lives. And uh, this is, of course, very important because culture here is also partly a tool for building up resilience and uh, how this influences the way people think about it has, of course, consequences of how people respond to crisis. And uh, this is a very useful chapter in this respect, looking more at uh, the side of the people, if you will, and uh, maybe less so on the side of volcanology, but bringing it together in a very elegant way, in my view. So I'm very happy to have that chapter in the book. Yeah, the same for me, Val. Um, it, it's a, a chapter that's uh, perhaps relatively unique in the context of the book because it looks at the the, the social side of, of volcanology. Um, and uh, from that point of view, it, it offers really a different perspective on Merapi um, for the book as a whole. Fantastic. So then let's move forward to uh, chapter number four. Do you want to say a word about that? Yes, sure. Uh, chapter four, again, one of those chapters uh, setting the scene, but at uh, this time not uh, based on the physical environment and the human context, but really providing the geological background um, of Merapi, describing its geodynamic setting within the, the Sunda arc, talking about uh, subduction processes and why, why Merapi is there, talking a little bit about um, Merapi's um, geology and geological evolution. And most importantly, it summarizes um, the regional geology, um, so the, the subvolcanic basement uh, of Merapi, so the, the rocks uh, Merapi is sitting on. And as we all know, sort of when magmas rise uh, through the magma plumbing system at Merapi, uh, these magmas interact with the subvolcanic basement and providing that geological background on the basement is quite important. Fantastic. And then this is followed by a chapter by Birger Lure from GFZ, and uh, Birger has been working in the area for quite some time. He's a geophysicist together with Ivan Kuyakov and uh, Sorianto, uh, Vivit Sorianto. And here we uh, see uh, results of a whole range of geophysical experiments that were carried out in a series of large scale projects over the years from uh, various organizations and um, sponsored from various countries, starting with uh, several um, European projects, German and French projects, but also the American projects. And uh, here the results are summarized in a chronological order. And um, it concludes with uh, a rather sophisticated 3D uh, analysis of the subduction zone that feeds Merapi and uh, how the fluids and uh, how the melts are actually migrating from the subducting slab towards the volcano. Surprisingly, things are not as often shown in textbooks. They're not going up straight. They're actually going up oblique from the subduction zone. And uh, this is rather intriguing. And it also makes a point about uh, how the volcanoes are connected in the region, not just Merapi being an isolated system, but how they actually connect to several of the other volcanoes and how they are fed from the subduction zone. I'll continue if you don't mind, because you are the first author of the next uh, um, uh, paper and I was the handling editor for that. And um, this is uh, led by, by you, Ralph, and uh, with support from a whole team of people. And uh, here you are discussing the uh, geological history, the chronology and the magmatic evolution of Merapi. So there is a lot of age dating that has been done going through the stratigraphy of the various deposits from old Merapi, as we often refer to, towards the more modern evolution. There has been some chemical changes towards more potassium rich lavas over time. And there is a pinpoint, there's a point in time where these changes are really manifesting itself and you're discussing that in detail. And um, this is of course fundamental because uh, here with this stratigraphy, with this chronology, we are able to really outline how the volcano evolved and uh, it allows us to kind of place new findings within the chronological framework. And uh, here, I think it's a vital contribution in this context. Would you like to add anything about your chapter, Ralph? <laughs> yes, well, yeah, um, it, it's really a, a synthesis of, of many people's work uh, at Merapi, in particular on the geology and the stratigraphy on Merapi. And I really like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors here, um, 
uh, like uh, Marianne Del Marmol, who did her PhD at Merapi in 1989, uh, Chris Newhall, who has been involved in research at Merapi uh, for decades and established the basic um, uh, stratigraphy and chronology uh, as well, together with Indonesian colleagues like Supriyati, Andreas Stuti. Um, so really the, this work tries to synthesize all the work that has been done on Merapi in terms of the geology and, and the geochemistry and petrology through time. And hopefully it's a, it's a nice chapter um, uh, to, to illustrate where we are at the moment in our present knowledge and, and also show some of the, the open questions we still have, which actually um, in part may be addressed by the next chapter, um, which is by Sutikno Bronto, uh, another Indonesian colleague uh, who is an expert on Merapi and has worked at Merapi for decades uh, on the geology. And in particular, Sutikno um, recently, uh, here in chapter seven, um, he discovered with, with some other uh, colleagues a huge debris avalanche deposit um, in the southwestern and southern part of Merapi which he infers to uh, be from the Merapi volcano. And the importance of this chapter is that we know from the structure of Merapi that um, Mer Merapi had one or possibly more sector collapses, flank collapses in its uh, geological history, destroying what we call old, call old Merapi. And the theory is that new Merapi, the present cone, then grew after this uh, sector flank collapse event. And the problem was always we didn't have a debris avalanche deposit. So so Tigno Bronto now found a huge debris avalanche deposit, um, uh, which comes from Merapi and which may help to resolve this long-standing issue of the old Merapi collapse. Um, even so, um, it's a relatively new work, and uh, the date of that debris avalanche deposit uh, is not fully understood yet. So there's certainly more work that has to be done on on that important uh, new find uh, by Sutikno and uh, co-workers. Fantastic. I'm going to ask you to continue right away, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, so uh, the next chapter <laughs> then is um, by Yuval and and, and Frank. Indeed. <laughs> and that looks, uh, it's the first of a, a few chapters um, dealing with the petrology and the magma plumbing system uh, of Merapi. And, and this particular chapter looks at the petrology um, of Merapi, it looks at the lavas, and importantly, also it looks at sort of the plutonic fragments that have been ejected from Merapi during its eruptions, and it uses that information uh, really to shed light on the magma plumbing system, the magma storage, and I think one of the main results coming out of, of this work is that at volcanoes like Merapi, we don't have this sort of uh, magma storage zones at one particular level, but that we have sort of uh, sort of magma storage uh, zones or, or pockets throughout the, uh, the, the crust at Merapi where, where magmas are stored um, with lots of complex processes on the way um, from on the way by the magmas uh, through this magma plumbing system and interaction between different magmas, magma mingling, magma mixing, interaction with the with the uh, subvolcanic basement and so on. Um, so a really nice uh, overview of the magmatic process going, going on inside uh, Merapi and the processes that ultimately lead to Merapi erupting. Very, very kind words. Thank you very much. I should also, of course, make sure that uh, all the work by other people is acknowledged here because myself and Francis Deegan, we are summarizing a lot of work. We're compiling the work of many, many authors. So please do read the chapter. I just put it on Google Scholar. People can download the chapter as an individual chapter if you're really interested. And uh, it's uh, bringing together the work from many, many authors, uh, petrological work uh, for many years. So then I'd like to move on and uh, open up the next chapter. That's the textual perspective. And this is mainly based on uh, a method called crystal size distribution, looking at uh, the different uh, uh, populations of crystals and how they relate to each other in a more statistical way. And this is also with Ralph as a co-author, but it's led by Katie Brees, together with Frauke van der Swan and Julia Hammer. And um, it's a lot we learn from that. And maybe, uh, maybe uh, Ralph, you want to say a word about some of the more intricate aspects of the chapter? Uh, yeah, definitely. Again, it's a review uh, chapter, a synthesis chapter, which looks at 
the rock textures of Merapi, at the textures of the lava, at the textures of the product of explosive volcanic eruptions, um, where we studied uh, or Katie and then co-workers in particular, um, sort of pumice and, and, and scoria from more explosive activity. And it also looks at the textures um, of the, those plutonic fragments I just mentioned before, mm -hmm. uh, uh, work that was done by uh, Frauke and, and, and her co-workers, including you, of course. Um, Many and, years ago, yes. <laughs> many years ago. And uh, just to focus perhaps on one aspect, um, uh, the work by, by, by Katie, for example, focused on some of the recent eruptions in 2006 and 2010 and, and trying to find out what textures in the eruptive products, in the dome lavas and, and, and so on, can tell us about the transition in eruption style, what it can tell us about the processes and the time scales of magma ascent towards the surface and linking that uh, with sort of uh, the um, monitoring record we have, for example, of the 2010 eruption and uh, really thinking about um, how these processes are basically uh, can be seen in the rock. So it's my, it, it is a, a petrological tool uh, to understand sort of shallow magmatic processes at Merapi and the transitions from more effusive to explosive activity. Fantastic. Thank you very much. The next chapter, number 10, is led by Francis Stegen with the two of us as co-authors, so it doesn't matter who makes the summary. So I'll just continue if that's all right. So it um, is a discussion of uh, magma carbonate interaction processes. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this, Merapi sits on a carbonate platform that goes back all the way to uh, Mesozoic time. And um, it's uh, cutting through that rather thick package of sedimentary material. It's up to eight, 10 kilometers thick. And of course, there will be unavoidably some interaction between the magma and these sediments. And uh, we also have a lot of these xenolith carbonate or uh, in fact, scarn xenolith in the eruptive products. And uh, this of course uh, implies that uh, there is not only contamination of the magma, there is also liberation of gas. And this is very important. This was initially realized already by the Dutch survey workers, but it has become um, a more increasingly recognized over the last two decades and uh, has led to a whole bunch of papers over the last few years. And this is neatly summarized here. And uh, one of the key conclusions is that during eruptive periods, uh, a lot of the gas coming out may, in certain cases at least, uh, be uh, derived from liberation of carbon dioxide from, from the limestone basement. And this may not always be the case. Of course, here is a mix between deep magmatic processes and uh, remobilization processes. But uh, in various eruptions, this may have various contributions and uh, it's an important process to recognize, I think. Would you like to add something or should we move on to the gas chapter? Um, no, just perhaps, you know, I, I think this work has been and is very important. Um, we know that magma carbonate interaction is an important process at, at some volcanoes, uh, very important volcanoes such as Vesuvius and Popocatepetl, uh, for example, in Mexico. And uh, really, Merapi is a very important uh, case study in, um, in, in, in that context uh, where really significant advances have been made um, about the processes of magma carbonate interaction. And uh, this chapter nicely synthesizes um, that work, which has been done over many, many years. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Thank you very much. Then chapter 11. Um, this is uh, led by Olivier Nadeau. And then we have Hanni Komida from the observatory and Patrick Allah from Paris. And this is about the volcanic gases. And it goes through early attempts to sample the gases to increasingly more modern attempts and even to automated gas sampling. And gas sampling is, of course, very tricky if you have to do it by person. So increasingly more mechanized ways of doing this are important. And it discusses the uh, different sources of the gases. Of course, a lot of the gas is coming from the deep subduction system, but it also recognizes contributions of uh, gas components from the crust and uh, discusses this in quite some detail. And uh, this gives a very good base for future work in the region. And uh, it also allows a comparison 
between other volcanoes and Merapi to see how much of the different components may have been contributed to specific periods of degassing and uh, even to eruptive versus non-eruptive periods where we believe now that there's actually some differences because uh, volcanoes uh, degassing quietly have a different gas mixture often than uh, volcanoes that are erupting violently. So if that's okay for you, Ralph, then we'll move on to number 12. So yeah, so chapter 12, um, it's really a chapter that deals with the last really large magnitude eruption, the last volcanic disaster at Merapi in 2010, uh, which we have all experienced and ha have been involved with. So this has been a VI4 eruption, an eruption that turned out to be a magnitude larger, at least uh, compared to the normal sort of eruptions Merapi typically had in the sort of uh, sort of 19th and 20th uh, century. Um, it's led by uh, Subandrio, former head of the Merapi uh, Volcano Observatory, and it, it covers really all aspects of the 2010 eruption from the eruption chronology, the uh, uh, evolution of the uh, eruption from the first signs uh, when sort of the uh, geophysical um, uh, monitoring uh, signals went up about a year before the eruption. Uh, it covers the acceleration um, of the monitoring signals ahead of the eruption, um, the, the changes to the alert levels and uh, from then on um, sort of uh, describes the course of the eruption. Um, it looks at the uh, deposits of the eruption, uh, which were produced during this uh, essentially two to three week period in, in 2010. It does look into the magma plumbing system, describing the petrology of the eruption products um, and gives some uh, synthesis of those processes uh, inferred to have occurred uh, in the magma plumbing system before the eruption occurred. And then uh, importantly, it looks also at the challenges relating to the, um, the, the volcanic crisis and the crisis management, uh, which, as I said, started actually uh, in the weeks before the eruption, and it continued uh, sort of for a long time after the eruption. So it looks looks at the crisis management, the um, uh, all the authorities uh, involved in, in in that, and also the uh, the problems related to evacuations uh, and so on. So a, a nice overview of all aspects of that eruption. Again, written by a big team of um, um, sort of authors under the leadership of uh, Subandrio, um, with all contributing their their expertise uh, to that particular eruption. Wonderful. And I've just brought a few images in here, just Google search images of uh, Merapi in action. And as you can see, Merapi is, of course, very explosive. And the 2010 eruption was one of those, uh, you know, uh, rather big eruptions. It's uh, a one in a uh, 100 year type of eruption, people called it. And uh, there we have these big pyroclastic eruptions. So I wanted to kind of stress this. And then uh, the next chapter is on the Merapi Volcano Monitoring System, which um, is, um, of course, um, a large kind of system that evolved over many, many decades from initial observ uh, observation, visual observation, to increasingly more uh, uh, technology-based observatory uh, methods. And uh, Ralph, you may want to add something here, but uh, I think it's, uh, again, a large team of authors. Uh, many people have contributed to this and are, of course, uh, measuring things from uh, many, many different aspects to the present day. Yeah, absolutely. So again, it, it's it's a chapter uh, largely authored by an uh, Indonesian colleague from the Merapi Volcano Observatory, led by Agus Budisantoso, uh, with the involvement of colleagues from France and uh, from uh, Singapore, uh, essentially. And it really gives us gives an overview of the current state of the volcano monitoring at, at Merapi and how the volcano monitoring system actually developed based on essentially the work of our Indonesian colleagues, but also with the support uh, from, from colleagues elsewhere uh, who supported um, the Merabi Volcano Observatory in setting up seismic networks uh, and so on. And, and the interesting thing is, um, so Merabi is really now, or Merabi now has the most modern volcano monitoring system uh, in Indonesia. And I remember 
one of the review, external reviewers of the chapter, he was actually quite amazed and surprised, perhaps even by uh, really the, the state of the volcano monitoring at that volcano. It's really a very modern um, uh, volcano monitoring uh, system. And it's incredible the, the knowledge um, we have now about you know, interpreting volcano monitoring signal and using that uh, uh, during volcanic crisis management. Fantastic. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And uh, as we all know, it only erupted, Merapi only erupted a few days ago again. And uh, I'm just uh, going to bring up some some headline here. The uh, the uh, footage is just uh, amazing. It's just spectacular. And uh, I mean, of course, it's very dangerous for local populations, but uh, this is a, a very active volcano and it needs to be monitored uh, at a very high level of sophistication. Now, moving on to uh, chapter 14, this is led by Thomas Walter, and this is about radar sensing at Merabi. It's not really my kind of topic, but uh, Thomas is a specialist in a kind of remote sensing, and uh, he's summarizing the different methods here, the different uh, developments over time, and uh, the state of the art in that kind of field. So, Ralph, do you want to kind of build on this a little more? Yeah, again, you know, it, it fits into this whole context of sort of um, monitoring uh, Merapi and using uh, sort of remote sensing uh, techniques to understand uh, the volcano better. We all know these techniques become more and more uh, important and uh, more widely used simply because it's often also safer to use those than um, working very close to the, to the volcano itself. Um, and the next chapter uh, by Helen uh, Damavan and co-workers, um, adds to this uh, topic, um, Correct, yeah. essentially using uh, unoccupied aircraft systems um, or drones uh, to monitoring Merapi, um, for example, by monitoring lava dome growth in the summit area. So it's a nice way that, uh, to, to monitor these processes at the summit of Merapi, so you don't always have to go up there and put yourself in danger, um, but you do it remotely. And uh, these techniques, of course, become more and more important and contribute significantly to the uh, almost day-to-day -day monitoring of the volcanic system. Absolutely. This leads us on to uh, the next chapter by Sylvain Chabonnier. And uh, this is about uh, the pyroclastic density currents, pyroclastic flows, as we would traditionally call them uh, in a more colloquial uh, way. And uh, well, Merapi has these collapsing domes and it creates these pyroclastic density currents that rush down the hills. And these are pretty hot and these are pretty fast moving. And uh, this is, of course, a huge hazard. And uh, Sylvain has pioneered modeling of these to work out how they will actually travel down the ravines and valleys and how they will distribute things and how uh, uh, ash clouds will actually separate from these uh, pyroclastic flows and therefore uh, inundate uh, areas in the surrounding and even, yeah, effectively obliterate uh, things in their way. Now, most of these collapses, storm collapses, produce rather kind of short, stubby pyroclastic flows, but some of them can be rather large, particularly if aided by internal explosions, and then they can travel for quite some distance from the volcano. And uh, to understand those is, of course, a major challenge. And uh, this has caused the death of many people, local population, as well as many volcanologists in the past, because they are somehow hard to predict. And these numerical approaches here are a major step towards improving safety around volcanoes. Yeah, absolutely, Val. Um, pyroclastic flows or pyroclastic density currents, as, as you know, are... Uh, it's really the, the most hazardous volcanic phenomenon at, at Merapi. Um, essentially, every eruption at Merapi um, is associated or produces pyroclastic flows and pyroclastic density currents. And it's uh, people like Sylvain Chabonnier and, and Karim Kelfoun uh, with their um, uh, applying numerical simulation codes like Titan 2D or Volkflow um, and, then, and who pioneered uh, or, or started to to use those techniques at, at Merapi to to really understand where pyroclastic flows go, how far they would travel, which areas they would affect, and again this will become as the models improve an important um, almost real time monitoring uh, monitoring tool uh, in the future and during future volcanic crises. Great. So now we're moving towards the last two chapters. Chapter seventeen is uh, led by Jean Claude Touré. 
and colleagues, uh, many colleagues here, and uh, this is about the lahars. Lahar is actually an Indonesian term, and it describes mud flows, potentially even hot or warm mud flows. And uh, this is a major risk, as we know from the Nevada del Ruiz catastrophe in the 1980s, mud flows can be uh, as, if not more devastating than some other phenomena at volcanoes, because they can travel very far and uh, they travel down the river valleys and uh, mud flows are, uh, they are effectively uh, almost as liquid as water, but they have the consistency of, of concrete in many, in many uh, ways. And uh, that means that uh, they are very damaging when they rush down the hills. So uh, this is, of course, a major contribution here because it's a major risk. And uh, in fact, the city of uh, Jogja is in part actually built on lahar deposits. So this is a widespread phenomenon that's not only a risk for the people living in the valleys, it's actually a, a regionally important phenomenon that has given rise to the flat and very fertile plains south of Merapi where a lot of agriculture is happening. And this is where a lot of people live. So the uh, issue is a continuing issue. It's uh, something that is still affecting people to the present day and therefore understanding these is vital in this context. Yeah, um, just to add, uh, yeah, lahars or mud flows um, are, uh, apart from pyroclastic density currents or pyroclastic flows, the most hazardous volcanic phenomenon at Merapi. And it's it's a phenomenon that can last for, for many, many years after you have an eruption. So after 2010, we had lahar occurrences, in particular during the Indonesian rainy seasons, uh, for years to come. That means... Uh, after an eruption, you know, the, the areas around Merapis in the river valleys are affected um, uh, by volcanic phenomena, hazardous volcanic phenomena for years to come. And that, that's an important uh, uh, thing to consider because uh, after eruptions, um, the valleys around Merapi, they are full of people, you know, um, people uh, who mine the, the sand from um, and the blocks from the pyroclastic flow deposits. And uh, they are always or often uh, or might be at risk from, from volcanic mud flows or lahars, which uh, can be triggered relatively quickly when it's, when you have a strong rain in the area. So understanding what triggers lahars um, and how they behave, how far they travel is an important um, aspect as well and how to actually anticipate them again from, from things like volcano monitoring data. Yes, and have early warning as well. I mean, there's uh, various ways of... Uh... Uh, making sure that we know in advance when they're coming so that we can clear the path. And uh, this is, of course, crucial, something that has led to disasters in the past by not knowing that they're coming. So, and uh, the final chapter, just to conclude, uh, that is a little summary chapter led by uh, Made from the observatory. And uh, it includes all the editors, so yourself and uh, also Tom Walter, myself and uh, Antonius. And uh, this is a bit of a summary, but also looking at future challenges um, at Merapi and beyond. And of course, there is a set of challenges. I mean, we want to understand uh, the volcano's behavior a lot better, but uh, many things are still somewhat opaque to us. Many phenomena, the combination of phenomena is not always clear. And uh, the good news is the recent eruption has not caused any fatalities. So I think uh, overall there's huge improvement. And as you probably know, the uh, uh, volcano fatality index globally is improving dramatically. We have less people, proportionally speaking, uh, dying from volcanic eruptions. And hopefully this will also be something that we will see at Merapi and continuous efforts are required in order to achieve these improvements over a long time. Yeah, uh, just to add, um, I, I think the, the chapters in the book really um, provide a state of the art of, of what we know about Merapi. And as you said, um, essentially uh, in all those aspects from looking at the magma plumbing system to looking at volcanic phenomena, understanding dome forming eruptions to aspects of social science and and volcano monitoring and, and crisis and risk management. Um, there are all challenges ahead and, and a lot of work uh, still to do, definitely. Absolutely, absolutely. So my last question is uh, towards you, Ralph. So now after all that work and all that uh, kind of, you know, 
thinking about this particular volcano after years of effort. Uh, how does it feel to have a, accomplished this major book? I mean, it's a bit of a milestone, I like to think at least. Oh, I, I think it's a milestone, uh, Val. Um, uh, you know, I, I did my, my PhD at Merapi. I know, in, I know. <laughs> in the late 1990s. And, uh, you know, um, if you work um, at a volcano like Merapi and spend a lot of time there, you you... You, you somehow have an emotional bond to 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 the volcano and the people you you meet along the way and um so this really uh, represents a milestone and uh, you know uh, um you know of not just my but everybody's work on that important volcano and um yeah it's good to have and uh, now we can uh, move on from from here and then see see what's next definitely <laughs> fantastic let me just quickly share my screen once more and that is uh i have uh i have uh this here so i i also think it's 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 a milestone in the sense that we have come a long way but there's still a long way to go in order to make sure that people are entirely safe at the volcano. So, but here, uh, a little kind of note, you can order the book, of course, on the Springer webpage, but you can also do this on Amazon if you prefer. So it's now available since February 23. It's a little on the pricey side, but you get over 500 pages, well illustrated, and really, as Ralph says, uh, at the absolute top level of our understanding we are very proud i'd like to think uh, that we really managed to be at the cutting edge of research at merapi and uh hopefully this will kind of you know set the stage now for quite some years to come and will be a good reference framework for people working in the region and allow us to move forward to yet more improved methodologies of Merapi and make life there yet more safe for the local population. I couldn't have said that any better, Val. So, oh, uh... you're too kind, Rob. <laughs> 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 okay, fantastic. So I think um, that's a, a reasonable introduction and uh, I'd like to kind of close this here. Thank you very much, Ralph, for your time and for going through the book uh, with me. Hopefully people will uh, uh, appreciate the effort and, and make use of this. And I say thank you for leading this and for having worked on this for such a long time to make this possible, to create this stepping stone into the next level of Merapi research. Uh, thanks a lot, Val. And, and can I just say, I, I really uh, like to acknowledge uh, you and all the, the other uh, co-editors for, for your efforts and with, which made it. Uh, fun uh, to do, um, you know, and, and in particular, our Indonesian colleagues, you know, uh, absolutely who really, who really made that book possible. Um, and uh, so a big shout out to uh, Made and, and Antonio, Antonius uh, for, for their, their support and all the authors. Um, we, we managed to get a, a lot of uh, colleagues on board who have worked on Merapi for a long, long time and uh, a lot of Indonesian colleagues as well. So about half of the authors are from Indonesia and very proud of that. Um, I, I, I love that idea as well. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful achievement and uh, a, a really a, a big credit to the uh, collaborative spirit that all the workers there have shown from uh, the local to the international level, uh, really working together towards a bigger goal. And I'm very proud to have been part of this. Okay, I think we've kind of really used uh, the time uh, that we had and um, I'm gonna close this now. Thank you very much, Ralph, and uh, all the very best from my side. Thank Bye. you very much, Ralph. See you. Bye.